The aim of this video is to provide a brief history of history. It is designed as a basic introduction or orientation to some of the major themes of historiography over the last few thousand millennia. It is not designed as an exhaustive account of those themes in any way, but is merely designed as a, an introduction to them, so that as you begin to perhaps read larger books or articles about historiography, some of the themes are familiar to you. I generally periodize his, the history of history into three zones. Firstly, the pre-enlightenment period. Um, secondly, the period running from about the 18th century through to the end of the Second World War. So the dates that I've provided here are not meant to be precise. They are approximations and uh, just generally the beginning um, and the end of that particular second phase of history's history. And thirdly, I think um, of the last phase of history really being about the late 20th century and into the 21st century. We might think of this third one bringing us up into the 21st century. So in each of these particular eras, I think there was a, a general way we can maybe characterize what was happening to history. When we think of the pre-enlightenment period, really there's no organizing, clear organizing principle. And what I mean by that is that there, there were no institutions that really controlled the way history was done or thought about. It was done by quite a range of people for quite a range of different purposes. It's also important to remember that in the pre-enlightenment period, the world is not really globalized in the way that it is today. So there's some sense of regionality in that you might have Chinese scholars working on history in a fairly unique form. You might have um, Islamic scholars working on history in their own civilizations in perhaps the Middle East. And you might have European scholars working on history in their own unique ways um, in Western Europe. But generally, I think there are a few things that we can say about history in this period. And that is it's connected to a number of different things. Firstly, you might think, uh, think of history as being connected to mythology. And this is a common uh, trait within many civilizations that they developed mythological stories to perhaps explain their origins, um, help them make decisions in the present. So mythologies we might think of quickly as being associated with places like ancient Greece and Rome, um, but also um, in places like China and Southeast Asia, um, mythology was also a fairly common theme in civilizations. And those mythologies tended to have a very historical focus in terms of storytelling. Um, secondly, uh, it's also important to note that there were narrative forms of history being developed in the pre-enlightenment period. What I mean by narrative here is the types of histories that we might associate with someone like Herodotus or Thucydides. And those were, were histories that we might see as in some ways kind of familiar in the 21st century. They were stories that were essentially chronological and um, tried to basically tell an organized story of a particular set of events. Now, the methods that we use to compose those histories, we might um, have varying um, opinions on, but the idea is that they were basically recognizable narratives for a modern audience, particularly a modern Western audience. So there were already types of histories being written in the ancient world that we might all identify with in the 21st century. Also, history is intimately linked in the pre-enlightenment period with religion. Now, this goes from um, explicit examples of scholars attempting to perhaps write histories of a dynasty, incorporating um, religious or um, uh, supernatural themes. Um, and it might basically also be um, a, a focus on particular topics or issues that scholars wrote about. So, for example, the idea of a history of a particular church or something along those lines. Um, we also might relate the idea here that the, the major religious texts of the, the large religion, so Christianity, Judaism, um, Islam, those texts were actually taking shape in this period and, and um, they had a, a strong historical focus, much like the mythologies of many of the other civilizations we've already mentioned. Um, the stories of the Bible, for example, um, are in, in some way recognizable as uh, historical accounts. We may, again, disagree or agree with the validity of those accounts, but they try to tell a story from, say, start to finish, or explain the origins of a particular group, or why a particular set of events took place. And lastly, I think another, another theme that would be important to raise here is that history and politics became um, clearly linked in this period. In the sense that uh, the, many scholars actually began to talk about politics in historical ways and be, began to talk about history in political ways. So in some explicit accounts, you had 
for example, Roman historians um, trying to use history as a kind of political tool to inform leaders of the present day by showing examples of how past leaders had or had not ruled well. Um, so politics entered history as a very obvious theme um, in this particular period. What happened in the 18th and 19th century um, and really uh, defined, I think, especially the early 20th century is a process why, by which history, particularly in the Western world and, in, and perhaps we might even specify that as being Europe and America there, um, that history became narrowed. And what I mean by that is it was seen that the legitimate forms of history anyway were connected with the idea of professionalism. So this is also linked with a general trend in this period towards disciplinarity. So what is meant by the term disciplinarity is the idea that different forms of knowledge um, are, are seen as distinct. So for example, you might enter a university and you would see in this period the emergence of very distinct faculties, natural sciences, philosophy, theology, history, sociology, and so on. And within each of those faculties, what you tended to have is groups of professionals who had perhaps been trained, um, usually fairly rigorous, rigorously actually in this period, and had in some sense been given uh, entitlement to the idea that they were guardians of that particular profession. So for example, to become a professional historian in this period, you would generally have to go and complete a PhD, which was a substantial research project um, that was designed to be completed over several years and demonstrate your ability to work very critically um, with historical documents and demonstrate that you were able generally to be able to write very um, clearly and academically. And once you had proven that skill, then you um, gave yourself a chance of perhaps getting a job in one of those departments. So it really, in this sense, this period, there, there's not the sense here that I'm trying to suggest that history was only done by professionals, but in general, people, I think, particularly historians, tended to think of history really properly or proper history being really done by professionals. So there was a kind of narrowing focus around that particular period. In the late 20th century, I think we generally see a re-emergence of the kind of, perhaps we might call it disorder, that seemed to define the pre-enlightenment period. In the late 20th century, we've seen history being done by all sorts of different people, and that actually being celebrated in a way that I think it perhaps wasn't in this second period that we discussed here. So in um, A Global History of History, Daniel Wolf talks about this idea in the 20th century that history became fragmented again, similar to how, as I suggested, it had been in the pre-enlightenment period. And what he really means by this is that history becomes um, something that is done by professionals, sure, but also by people who have not been trained necessarily as historians. So you get journalists writing history, you get filmmakers making historical films, you get documentary makers making historical documentaries, um, you get writers who are developing fictional accounts of the past, you get all kinds of history in the late 20th century and the 21st century. Now a positive reading of that fragmentation is perhaps that it's democratized history. You might often hear that word democratization of the past in historiographical readings. And what that really is suggesting is that there's a positive way to understand this fragmentation, and that is that it's become, history has not be, uh, become not the preserve of professionals, but has actually become um, something that anybody can do. And that's a, something that many people would celebrate because the more voices they suggest, the better. There are some people obviously who would kind of bemoan this, so many professional historians might um, be lamenting the fact that other writers, perhaps even fictional writers, sell more works than they do, or um, that films are more popular than history books. But the idea of fragmentation, I think, is fairly safe. Whether we read that positively or negatively, that's kind of up to you. Um, so to add another layer to this diagram, what I'm suggesting here in an overview sense is that history went through a period of um, kind of uh, disorganization, um, that it was being done by many different people, many different parts of the world, with no real clear organizing principle. What happened in this middle period is that it began to be narrowed around professionalism, and that in the 20th century and into the 21st century, it has once again become quite fragmented. Um, and I'll also add three words to perhaps uh, three other words to describe these periods that you might come across often when people discuss the history of history. And that is the idea of the pre modern world, the modern world, and the post modern world. Um, and what's really being suggested there 
is really just labels to help um, understand the, the general social, political, and economic context that we're talking about. Um, Postmodernism, obviously, a very contentious issue that will be addressed in a later video, um, and uh, modernism, obviously, revolving around the idea of industrial modernity. Um, and pre-modernism really being, um, another word you could think of here is perhaps pre-industrial, the pre-industrial world. Okay, but I also think pre-enlightenment helps to give that some definition as well. So as I said at, this, at the beginning, this is not meant to be an exhaustive account of the history of history. It is meant to be a basic orientation to some of the themes that you might come across in larger readings of historiography.